So let's get this started. Hi, good afternoon, um, and welcome to MOLA's 2020 Dia de los Muertos Festival. My name is Solimar Salas, and I'm the Vice President for Museum Content and Programming at the Museum of Latin American Art. And on behalf of the team, I'd like to thank you for joining us today as we learn more about this special tradition and give you a taste of Dia de los Muertos. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the event sponsor that made it possible to make this two-week event free of charge. Here's a brief welcome from our presenting sponsor, Hyundai. Welcome to the 2020 Day of the Dead virtual celebration presented by Hyundai. We are thrilled to be a sponsor for this great event. We hope that you enjoy the beautiful traditions that make this annual celebration so special. Have a great day. Additional support was received from the Kenneth T. and Eileen L. Norris Foundation, the Best J. Hodges Foundation, Arts Council for Long Beach, Robert Gumbiner Foundation, and the City of Long Beach. We also have today, and I will invite everybody to put your questions or comments into the Q&A section. We will be monitoring that section. And we have one of our speakers today, Griselda Suarez, that will join us in the Q&A. So feel free to join in on that side. Um, our guests today will be Chef Luis Navarro and Griselda Suarez, where they will talk about the history of mole, its meaning and tradition as part of their family heritage. Griselda Suarez is a writer, artist, cook, and a teacher. She was born in unincorporated East Los Angeles and walked Whittier Boulevard and Brooklyn Avenue in black and white saddle shoes. She grew up in a place where her thoughts did not easily find voice. Instead, she found a pen and paper. Her hometown inspires her to investigate memories of a home space that continues to be bodiless. She believes that the arts are essential in empowering others to express their thoughts. Throughout her career, she has created programming and training dedicated to facilitating transformation and creating agency for our communities. In 2016, she became the executive director for the Arts Council for Long Beach. Most recently, Griselda was awarded 40 under 40 by the Long Beach Post for her leadership in the arts and her resiliency in battling cancer. Suarez is dedicated to Long Beach and loves con contributing to the city because she strongly believes in the impact of local impact arts has on residents' lives. Chef Ruiz Navarro has dedicated his career to learning and traveling through all of Mexico's enchanting regions. From Veracruz, Mexico City, Yucatan, Baja California, and Oaxaca, studying family and the craft of the local cuisine and indigenous ingredients. Established in 2007, the Navarro family has always had a love affair with, the Me with Mexican food. And you can see that in Lola's Mexican cuisine. Their grandmother passed down her recipes to Lola when she was just a little girl growing up in Guadalajara, Mexico. Everything made from scratch, and that is exactly what you can expect at Lola's. And we will actually have an opportunity to meet Lola, and we'll see how that goes. So thank you, Griselda, for being with us today in the chat. And I think we're ready for, um, for, the, for the recording. Well, thank you, Solimar, so much for having us today. I appreciate you inviting me to join Luis here from Lolas and the entire Lolas team today. Um, hi, Luis, how are you? Good, good morning. Good you know, morning. Um, excited, you know, doing something a little different. Um, you know, even though typically we'd be doing this in person, you know, with, I think, uh, you know, a little bit of an audience, but you know, excited to at least uh, do something nice. Yes, me too. And I, you know, you and I were talking about, we were just kind of checking in in between the Dodger games, I think. And we're like, it's mole season, our favorite time of the year. Yeah, it's funny too, because uh, my dad, you know, he's living, he's retired. He's living in, uh, in Tijuana. So he was down for this past week. Um, and that's the first thing he did, he brought mole. He goes, oh, I got this awesome mole, I'm coming down. And as I mentioned it to you, you're like, my mom just brought me mole too. Yes, <laughs> my mom just, just beautiful, my beautiful mom, just um, llegó de Mexico, you know, with the pandemic, she wasn't sure if we were gonna be able to see each other. It's been a while, but she brought me mole de bola. It's all this beautiful, smells so great made by my family. Uh, my family is, is well known for making mole. 
And so they grind it out several times a year. And so this is my my portion. Oh, so beautiful. I'm very excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you have for us today, Luis? What are we going to go over today? You know, um, when the museum reached out, you know, and they, they were interested in <clears throat> doing this discussion, you know, I know you and I did something very similar a few years back. Um, you know, and right now with it, yeah, it's starting to get a little cooler and we're starting to go into, you know, it's been fall, but obviously here in Southern California, it's, you know, our summers tend to drag. Um, but as of like right now, it's starting to cool down. And this is immediately when people start shifting into, you know, a little bit richer foods, more aromatics and obviously comfort. And, you know, when you're a Latino specifically, you know, us being Mexican, what does that mean? You know, it means moles, pozole, you know, as we start getting into a little bit of that chilly weather, mm -hmm. it, that's our comfort. Right. So true. So true. I know that also as we're, we're as people get ready for um, Dia de los Muertos, Las Ofrendas, um, mole, mole makes it, plays a big part in Ofrenda. I know many people offer that to their family who are coming to visit. Yeah, you know, um, you know, if, I don't know, it's off to my left here, but, you know, we have our altar ready to go and, you know, we're inviting a lot of our staff and obviously uh, our neighboring community, you know, customers that come in, if they want to bring in a photo, you know, of their loved ones that have passed, you know, so we could remember them. And at the same time, this is the time that we start going into our traditions, you know, which is uh, obviously pan de muerto, um, you know, uh, chiles en hogada, mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, a few weeks back it was seasoned. And now, you know, we start gearing into our moles. Yeah. So um, to answer your question, at Lola's we feature, uh, we're featuring four moles right now. Um, and we feature them year round, but we switch them off and on. You know, like sometimes we'll bring uh, mole mancha manteles, mm -hmm. you know, or we'll do uh, mole coloradito. Um, right now, we happen to have uh, a pistachio mole, you know, which is uh, something a little bit different, but the, the, the champion, I guess, in, in the dish is the pistachios. Um, we have a mole verde, you know, and this particular one comes from the region of Guanajuato. Um, and it's a very vibrant, uh, green, earthy, chile poblanos, um, has, you know, romaine lettuce, cilantro. So, you know, what you ultimately get is this beautiful, bright green mole, you know, and obviously what gives mole its body and its consistency uh, is all of the seeds and nuts, which were very available, uh, you know, to our region in Mexico, uh, taking it back you know, centuries and even thousands of years ago, uh, which comes like the peanuts, you know, which is now, you know, we pronounce it as cacahuate, you know, but if you were to take it back to the Aztec, Aztec dialect, it's cacahuatel, you know, and these are ingredients which are obviously still very um, used and available in our culture and our cuisine today. But at the same time, they're ingredients that are very ancient to our culture. Um, next is the uh, mole poblano, which <clears throat> is probably the most famous mole. I think that when you tell anybody in the general population and you mention mole, that's immediately the one that comes to mind. And, you know, it's the, also the number one that gets butchered. You know, it's it's the one that uh, uh, you could either it's the most delicious or it could be also the most disgusting. Um, okay. And I think people okay. have had a lot of butchered ones. Yes. Um, yes. You know, you know, because you tell people, oh, you know, mole, and they'll be like, oh no, is that that really super sweet chocolate sauce? Right. You know, and uh, and that's it's nothing of the sort. You know, now does it take you know chocolate? Yes. You know, and does it is it sweet? Yes, but at the same time, it's perfectly balanced with savory. And I think that that's where the butchering comes into play. Um, 
But anyways, that's the, the most famous one, you know, from Puebla. Uh, and then last, you know, which uh, I think is really uh, the holy grail of Moles. Um, it happens to be probably my favorite just because of the intricacy, um, the amount of ingredients. Like uh, I have the, uh, the recipes here, which I think uh, Solimar will, from the museum will be sharing. You know, but the mole verde is two pages. The pistachio mole is one page. Uh, the poblano is two pages. And then we have the mole negro and it's like four pages. You know, and it literally, it's like ingredients. I, I mean, it, it, it's a labor of love. And I think that's why I call it the Holy Grail. Um, we started offering it at Lola's in January. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's what I thought would be a, a good feature for us to discuss today. That's great. So uh, thank you so much. And so before we, we move on to, to sharing, I want to um, share a few images with our viewers today, those who, of you who are joining us. Muchas gracias. Están en casa, bienvenidos, ven provecho if you're having some lunch right now. Um, I want to uh, share my screen with you and also, there we go. So uh, I want to bring with us today uh, the deity Chantico, um, which in many ways we can consider to be the dual god goddess. Um, there are many uh, records of this deity being referred to as she and in others being referred to as he. And so I think of them as a two-spirit deity that um, reigns over spice, spiciness, chile. Um, and this, this particular deity broke a fast in order to eat chile. So that's why we revere them for uh, providing <laughs> chile to us. Um, I also have a picture here of um, some mole um, eating, um, which I think is, like I said, is the season of, of, the mo of mole. You know, um, mole is a, a Spanish interpretation of a Nahual word, um, muli, a mole, and um, it's the act of mixing. So actually, if we, if we were to um, show you a tier, a pyramid of all the different moles, we eat mole every single day in salsa form, right? That's just how, how we consume it. It's the mixing of um, chile and other ingredients. Um, and so now we say mole, right? And, and there are, it's a very traditional way of eating either mole in salsa or mole in a guisado, right? So, or mole in the most popular one, that's probably the one that sells out for a uh, Super Bowl Sunday is guacamole, another uh, Spanish word now you know, the other day, Luis, I was on a, I was ordering food and someone said, do you want to walk with that? I'm like, oh, wow, we're, we're now in a new dimension now that we're calling it walk. I was going to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> everyone was, oh, just walk, walk, you know, or, you know, the other one too, that irks me is uh, avocado smash. What? You know what no. I, and I, yeah. Yeah. And I've heard that one and I'm like, oh, you know, and you'll see it on menus, you know, throughout LA, <laughs> my whole team here is laughing. Um, wow. And, you know, it's to me, you know, and I don't want to get into it, but it becomes disrespectful, you know, because, you know, when I grew up, you know, I was I was taught the 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 legacy, yeah. you know, the history of uh, what it is and how it became today. You know, yeah. and you think of, you know, and, and we would go over things like, you know, an aguacate, you know, and that's current day. Uh, Spanish uh, pronunciation and but the original pronunciation you know was aguacatel mm -hmm. and then you would mention the guacamole you know and I don't think you know people are just like oh yeah I just want that avocado stuff yeah. you know or, or now you're starting to see these um, hipster chefs you know calling it avocado smash and right. no, you know, it's a guacamole, which, yes. you know, 
the molet of the aguacate, the mix, and the, you know, uh, whatever ingredients you want to do, chile serrano, you know, I've seen people put pomegranate and yes. so many different things that you could do with it. But yes. to me, it's it's special. It is special. And I, and I also want to thank you for, for also bringing up, you know, that this is something we've learned growing up. You and I often share stories about our family's regions and how this cultural pride in our food has been instilled in us and we share it with others. You know, um, uh, I don't know why it's not, there we go. Let's just go this way. Um, so something else I wanted to share with everyone, you know, you talked about the different moles that we're going to be um, talking about today. And there's a lot of leyendas, legends in Mexico about how mole came to be. And in some ways I get really upset when uh, the Catholic church wants to take mole away from us um, in a way. They say that uh, from some, some divine intervention, the, the monjas, the nuns of these small churches and you know, around the country um, and there's three legends, but one of them is the most famous in, in Puebla, that um, there was an accident of some sort and some spices just happened to fall into a stew and salsa that was already boiling and voila, you have uh, mole, which is not the case, <laughs> <laughs> right? Mole has existed for many, many years and I'm showing right now an image of the trades, uh, the trade routes. And um, in the simplest terms, like I said earlier, mole was the chile and some, some local native ingredients of Mexico. And as we started having contacto um, with, with uh, other countries and through these slave trades and through the uh, food trades, we started adding more ingredients like garlic, for example, right? Things that came from other parts of the world. Um, and so, it is a native dish. And then as it gets more complex and more ingredients are added, you get to see the kinds of contacts from Europe um, that came to Mexico, which is pretty amazing, I think, to, to look at the history of mole in, the, in that way. Yeah, you know, um, on that note, <clears throat> um, and I, I don't think a lot of folks know, but you know, I've done a lot of um, research and uh, spent a lot of time in Mexico. Um, and really for me, it was just kind of going back into, uh, my roots, you know, and when it comes to, uh, my family, you know, I'm a first generation, you know, my parents are from Guadalajara, uh, and started really, you know, I, I wanted to go and start digging to see the real side of the cultural food and the influences that created, you know, simple things like al pastor or, you know, right. and um, I was in Veracruz and we were there on a chef's trip and we're studying the, the cuisine there. And it was amazing. It was something that um, to this day uh, blew my mind, you know, and really kind of going off of what you just discussed, you know, um, they had their specific mole that is a mole veracruzano, mm -hmm. you know, and for me personally, it was very sweet, but it was because of the English influence because Veracruz was the main port in Mexico. I mean, it was probably one of the biggest ports in the entire world uh, for a couple hundred years, you know, and what they would do is the Europeans would bring all of their trade hit Veracruz, unload, go across Mexico and off into the Pacific Ocean. So in Veracruz, they cook with capers. They cook with, I mean, uh, Worcester sauce. There's so much English influence. Um, and I was amazed. I, I, I couldn't believe. Uh, and in a sense, it's beautiful, you know, to see these different cultures and different world ingredients to create uh, you know, a recipe. Absolutely. You know, right here I have um, our region, right? Our Western region of Mexico that encompasses all these states, including Jalisco, where my mom is from, and Michoacan, where my dad is from. I know you'll be featuring something from Guanajuato today, right? So this Western region, uh, 
I think it's a, it, because it was on the route to the Pacific, just like you said, it was an, also a region that gathered a lot of other spices from the world and other influences. So why don't, yeah, we, why don't, we, why don't we start with the mole? Go right ahead, Luis. Why don't we start with your first mole? Yeah, perfect. Uh, so the first mole that we're gonna start off with is going to be our mole verde. It's here. And this is our actual plate that, how we played it here. Make sure there's a way here, looks good. <clears throat> that is our mole verde. Uh, it comes with a uh, poached chicken breast. You know, and very simple. We poached the chicken breast with uh, garlic, onion, and salt. We poach it. You know, we pull it here, we, we slice it, and then we put the mole over it. And one of the big things that I have to educate a lot of our team a lot of the time is that um, people focus on the protein. And I think that that is a very American and European um, trait. You know, when we're going to have any meal, the protein is the the king it's the star of the dish well in mexico that's not always the case now mind you protein is special mm -hmm. but protein is expensive and not everybody has access to protein and when i mean protein i'm talking chicken uh guajolote uh chivo puerco uh any any you know let alone beef you know beef is so you know, that's, if you got it, it's special. Um, but when it comes to this mole dish, the the star of the plate is the mole, right. you know? And uh, we have a family joke, you know, where somebody was like, oh, you guys, the mole, it's all profit. And Brenda looked at, you know, my brother-in-law looks at him and starts laughing. And he's like, all profit. Like, do you understand like the ingredients that go into a mole? Yeah. You know, and you're talking peanuts, you know, any nut is obviously expensive. Um, and that's why I consider it to be a celebratory dish. You know, when you make mole, you're having it with your family. You know, this past Sunday, I mentioned my dad brought his mole from, uh, from Mexico. And, you know, I grilled pork chops. And my mouth's watering. And, you know, we made this delicious mole, but, it, you know, it was... Uh, breaking of bread with my father, you know, or you're going to invite very close friends over and you're going to show it's mole, you know. Um, so to kind of get into it, though, uh, this mole is from Guanajuato. And Guanajuato is known uh, very much so for agriculture, very much so for very beautiful vegetables. Uh, um, in the regions, it's grown with squashes and uh, calabazas, pumpkins, um, also happens to be the region where my wife's family is from. Um, but if you could see, and, uh, you know, I'm not, but you could see the vibrant green, um, and that's all due to, uh, vegetation, you know, and that's what gives it that color. It also gives it this very rich, uh, delicious earthy flavor. And then when you blend it with all of the nuts, you know, the nuts don't even, they have nothing to do with uh, the complexity. It has to do with the body. But you could taste the, the, the roasted chile poblano, the tomatillo, uh, you know, the chiles jalapenos or serranos, whichever ones you want to use. And then you add the cilantro at the very tail end. And then you got romaine and lechuga de bola. And all that is what gives this sauce it's you know uh beautiful color and complexity mm -hmm. and so, simplicity yes it's actually mole verde is one of my favorites and and i i, I would probably say that to every mole if you present it like oh it's one of my favorites i love yeah. love love mole <laughs> you know in 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 my frame in my picture i have a little um green screen over here and um it's of a guajolote because, you know, guajolote was the one served for like special times, you know, for, for the royal family of whatever tribe. Um, and 
growing up, we had uh, mole verde for Thanksgiving one day and I was floored. I was like, what is this, mom? And why have you made it before? Like, I love this stuff. Um, and I didn't know what they were doing. I thought I was missing out because we weren't having like traditional Thanksgiving in the American style. Well, I realized I was having like old school, way back traditional uh, food of my people, right? Um, whenever we would go to Michoacan, my mom, my grandma would raise her own patos and her own guajolotes. And as soon as we arrived, she's like, okay, go get a guajolote. Time to get ready for the mole, right? And it would take this really long process. And, and this one here, mole verde, is just an amazing example of using everything around you, right? Las hojas de casi todo. Hojas of this, hojas of that. What is green? What is special right now? What is growing? Let's put it into the sauce and add to it, right? It's just amazing. It's really great. Yeah, and when you look at really, you know, and right now, you know, I'm gonna, you know, obviously we're focusing on uh, the region of Mexico. Uh, and when you look at the cuisine and you look at how things were made, everything was made, uh, with what was available. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of these super delicious uh, dishes were made. You know, um, down in uh, Yucatan, you know, specifically Merida, for example, um, they're famous for the cochinita pibil, yes. you know, like, oh, cochinita pibil, cochinita pibil. Uh, you know, when you get down there and you actually start really studying and, you know, you're with the, you know, the Mayans, because, you know, everyone, oh, where did they disappear to? And you go there and they're still there. Yes. And the culture is still very much alive and very vibrant. Um, but you start learning that, you know, uh, cochinita, you know, happens to be that specific uh, pork uh, pig that is now thriving in the Yucatan region of Mexico. But that pork is not indigenous to Mexico. You know, that was brought in, you know, by the Europeans and sp specifically uh, Los Holandeses, you know, the Dutch, which that was their big trade route uh, to, in Merida, and there was a lot of trade going on there. Uh, so you start looking at this stuff, and the only reason I bring it up is because you brought up the guajolote, you know, which is turkey, and now you start going into it and going like, oh, wow, the guajolote is indigenous to Mexico. And that is a protein that was uh, very available, you know, and it, it goes into uh, stereotypes, right? And also, you know, uh, pre, pre uh, um, I guess, judgment uh, upon Mexican cooking, you know, where people don't, fully understand, um, I guess, the richness of the cuisine that uh, that Mexican cooking is, you know, and for one thing, it could be that um, for many of us that, you know, have come to the United States, um, we've done a bad job at showcasing uh, what Mexican cooking really is. You know, and people immediately think uh, tacos, burros, quesadillas, you know, all the, the antojitos. Um, but when you really start going into it, you start realizing that you are you can have this beautiful meal. You're talking about the mole verde yeah. that you had with turkey, you know, the guajolote for Thanksgiving. Yes. And, and you, you know, would blow we, someone's mind. I know, the mole verde, because, you know, usually we have the mole rojo. Right, mole rojo, michoacano, mancha manteles. That was the usual one. So when she went, she made green. I was like, what is this? This is amazing. Um, but you know, the mole, mole, if you look at a lot of the um, uh, indigenous records and, and codexes and all that stuff, you see that mole was eaten with, um, with iguana. Mole was eaten with guajolote, rana, right? With frog, with fish, um, with... Um, Gusanos de maguey, right? It was made with different kinds of proteins, right? It, the, the chicken and the pork and the beef did come 
from elsewhere, right? We were using what was around mole with deer. Deer was very popular in- Borrego. Um, yes, and Borrego. So one of my favorites. Okay, so what do we have next? What's the next one? So just to finish off this oh, yes. one, it's really kind of what you mentioned is, you know, um, for any of our listeners that are out there and that's watching is, you know, be creative, you know, especially with something uh, as dynamic as the mole verde, you know, uh, Griselda mentioned, you know, you could put it on sea bass, you know, you could put it on lamb, you could put it on a pork chop, and it doesn't always have to be chicken, you know, specifically with this one, because this, this sauce, it's, it's, so simple, but so dynamic at the same time. Um, but moving on, our next dish is going to be our mole de pistachio. And this is a beautiful dish here. And it goes in right into the topic of conversation that we were talking about, because this mole is served with uh, salmon, with salmon here at the restaurant. And when we designed this dish, Obviously, the, the mole is the, the star of the dish, and then it comes with its cast members, right? And with this particular one, in my opinion, you can't have mole without rice, because when you start mixing the two and you're eating it, and it's just like this perfect, it's like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> um, but now you have the salmon, and then we also did uh, calabacitas. And when we top the calabacitas, we put queso fresco. And uh, when you dig in and you get the, those flavors, one other thing I didn't mention is uh, we put it over a bed of uh, grilled spinach. And it, when you're talking of, of a flavor bomb, th this, is, this is one of our ultimate dishes, I would say. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And, and is this mole, um, is it thicker? Is it inspired by a pepian? Because I know there's pepianes with um, pepitas, there's pepianes with other nuts. Tell me more about uh, the pistacho. Yeah, and you know, this uh, particular mole, um, we launched it as a pepian. And, you know, we that's how we operated it for a long time. And for a lot of people, if you don't know what a pepian is, um, it's pretty much uh, the cousin of mole. And really the only thing that makes a difference is that the dynamic of the nuts isn't as uh, intense. Mm -hmm. um, with this one, you know, it becomes specifically uh, the pistachio is what is the, the, the flavor profile that you're gonna get, you know, and for everybody that's out there, you know, when you've eaten pistachios, uh, you get a very, um, it's like a toasted, uh, it's creamy, uh, you could get a little bit of the oil, and at the same time, it's um, a very mellow, nutty flavor, and that's what you get with this, which is why it pairs so perfect with, uh, for me, with the salmon, you know, and, and you just let that, let it go, and you let, as you're tasting it, and yeah, with a nice glass of white wine and <laughs> and done. <laughs> un, caballito, un caballito de tequila and you're good. Yeah. And yeah. you're good. Oh <laughs> um, no, it, it's true. The the pepian is is uh, very much centered on the nut or the seed, right? Depending on how you look at it and what you're using. Um, and you know the the pistacho uh, introduced to us, but we definitely have used it a lot in a lot of things in Mexican cuisine. Um, and you know, like the pistacho and the pepita. Um, if we go back to to the pre-contact tools, it was the molcajete, right? Um, and the metate, grinding it out with the with the metate. Um, and it would release that fat, that oil you're talking about, right? And so we still see that within the sauce today when you grind it out. Um, and it adds rich, rich, richness to the dish for sure. Yeah, you know, and not to get too deep, and, um, but... We're here to get deep, Luis. Yeah, when, when, <laughs> when you are, you know, when you're doing a lot of the cooking and, and testing, you know, you start realizing just how much fat and oil 
uh, our nuts really have, you know, and some are more than others, you know, like uh, one that I try to tell people, you know, they're very expensive, but um, are pine nuts, you know, and uh, when you get a little thing of pine nuts and you pop it in your mouth and you bite into it, it literally releases its oil, you know, and uh, when you're cooking with them, you're able to start seeing that oil, which typically we don't see because, you know, in our day and day lives where, you know, you're eating sometimes peanuts or trail mix or a little bag of almonds. But when you take it to the next step and actually start cooking with them, it's just, it's a whole nother universe. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and there's so many, um, you know, different even sauces or salsa every day. You know, there's a pepian kind of version in our household with walnuts um, and with uh, chiles. And it makes, it's the most popular chile salsa, all these words, right, in our house. Um, and whenever that's made, we all are ready to dig in because it adds heat and some sort of like some, some fat that just coats the heat because it's so hot that you need that oil to bring it down a little bit. But it's, uh, I love them. I love, um, I love using them. And, you know, when we had our, when we had our restaurant, Amy and I, that was one of the most popular sauces, that walnut, chile, pepian mix. People love that stuff. Oh, I can only imagine. It, oh, I, what it sounds like to me is almost like a uh, spicy Mexican version of uh, hummus, you know? <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. True. True. Um, all right. That looks delicious. I love Las Calabacitas there. That's a, a nice um, addition. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's a very, it's a perfectly balanced dish. Um, I know one thing with this particular uh, mole that I wanted to discuss, you know, as I'm looking at, at my ingredients here, <laughs> is that this one also, you know, takes uh, a ser the serrano pepper. Um, but when you mix the pistachio nutty flavor with the spiciness of the serrano, and uh, this actually is very uh, roasted garlic forward, and that is, I think, um, the flavor dynamic that makes this uh, particular mole uh, special. Ooh, you just made my mouth water with that one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I want to just also say that there's things that, you know, you I see in your dishes that I see in my mom's dishes and my grandma's dishes, right, las calabacitas. The, the fact that you're using spinach, you know, um, many times, also people I think that don't know the full breadth of Mexican cuisine think it's just beans and rice. Um, but you know, the spinach or, or quelites, right? Which is any kind of herb, you have them there on the dish. There's always some sort of quelite or verdolaga that also um, is in Mexican cuisine. And so there's always greens, right? In some way, shape or form. Always greens, you know, and growing up, that's how we were raised. You know, and I think a lot of people, um, you know, and a lot of it too is uh, opportunity, right? You know, and uh, here in the United States, you know, when we migrate here, you know, and things that a lot of people I don't think uh, like to discuss much or uh, it's a very interesting conversation, but um, when you're in Mexico and you have money, you don't have to come to the United States. You know, because you're living a very, very uh, beautiful life in Mexico if you have money, you know. And a lot of the times the people that come up north to the United States, it's because you don't have money and you don't have opportunity. And you're coming here to try to create that opportunity for your family and try to get ahead, you know. And what does that create? Well, a lot of times our families are working two jobs. You know, my mom worked three jobs when I was growing up. Um, and sometimes that's what it becomes. It becomes rice and beans. And, you know, your mom is home an hour or two out of the day. And, you know, and that's what we end up being forced to eat. But it's not necessarily what they would really want us to eat if that 
time. And obviously equity and opportunity was available uh, to a lot of these um, first generation families that are living here in the United States. Yeah, it was rice, rice, beans, and vegetables, right? Like the, all kinds of vegetables in my house. Like, que garbanzas, que calabacitas, que nopales, que nopales con huevito. Plagas. Yeah. You know, my mom would make uh, uh, the cauliflower, you know, battered con salsita de jitomate. Yes. You know, and that was, that was what we ate. You know, it yes. wasn't always carnitas and, yeah. you know, carne asada and, you know, everything that I think people um, imagine that that's yeah. what we eat every day. It's yeah. not, it's yeah. not necessarily. Yeah, like I think, that. I think the next one you and I should make are each our versions of tortas de coliflor and see, see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or tortillas uh, right. de camarón. Yes. <laughs> What's next? So next we got uh, our mole poblano, which we mentioned and we discussed. Um, and we're going to switch this one for this one. And here we have our mole poblano. Again, um, there's two, which is uh, the poblano and the verde. You know, those have been staple items on the menu at Lola's uh, since day one, since we opened. Um, and we always serve them with frijolitos de la olla and obviously with the Mexican rice. Um, this one also comes with the garlicky poached chicken. Um, one thing that I haven't mentioned though, uh, which right now that uh, the, this dish was you know, uh, passed to me and I was able to get that aroma is uh, the pickled onions, you know, and either people love them or they despise them and they hate them. But the reason, you know, a lot of people go, oh, why, does, why does mole always come with pickled onions? And the reason for that is, you know, uh, when you're in the Yucatan and you're having cochinita pibil, uh, they serve you pickled onions con habanero picado. Um, and with the moles, it's very similar. Uh, the cochinita is very rich. Well, moles are very rich as well. And when you're having a very rich sauce and you put the pickled onions in there and you're making yourself a little taquito or if you're eating it and, you know, uh, I, gra I grab a, some people trip out because, you know, when I'll eat, I get, eat like this is my tortilla. Yes. You know, and, uh, you know, you see people on there with their fork and knife and, you know, I grab my tortilla, I rip it and I'm just, yes. but what the, what the pickled onion does is the vinegar, the acidity of that pickled onion, it cuts right through the mole and you get an explosion of flavors, you know, and um, when you talk about that balance, you know, that I've mentioned a couple of times here, uh, when it comes to Mexican cooking, that's the epitome of it. You know, the epitome of it is you create this delicious, uh, very complex, rich sauce, and you have a vessel, which is the, you know, garlicky poached chicken, and then you add those pickled onions. And when you eat that in one soup, that's, to me, that's, everything there's nothing better yes and i see here too that you are adding the ajonjoli on top which is also a indicator of of its tier in mole hood if i could say like if, if <laughs> mole the ajonjoli on top definitely tells uh the eater right the the person look at this the class of mole it is right the where where it lives within the realm of moles Absolutely, you know, um, and this is, I would say is uh, the most famous mole that exists. You know, this is the mole uh, that you find around the world. You know, uh, this is the mole uh, that I think people, uh, when you mention mole, you know, this is the, their immediate reaction is to this mole. You know, and uh, I think it's it's because it's uh, it's not as complex to make. You know, it's not easy, but it's not 
it's it's right above the medium uh, difficulty level. Mm -hmm. um, and the ingredients that are needed for it are also readily available. Yeah. You know, and you get this beautiful deep red color, you know, from the chiles. Um, you can get very complex and dynamic with this mole, and some people do. Um, ours is actually uh, a little bit on the lighter side, uh, a little bit, um, I guess, easier uh, to eat um, because you, you know, I've had some mole poblanos where I'm like, whoa, you know, uh, I mean, they're putting uh, so many different chiles in there, and you know, it's delicious. Um, but ours, the way we, we make it is we make it a, a little bit more approachable. And at the same time, it's a little bit lighter, um, with its richness, but it still hits you with that punch of, of what a mole is supposed to be. Yeah. And I think, um, this is also one of the moles that I would like to share with folks and reminds me all the time when I see the sesame seed, you know, that, that is also another, uh, cue to let us know that this is this mole developed as well with the contact of the rest of the world you know the sesame seed is an african plant it's an african seed and so that's where contact come when you know el contacto um con el mundo is is evident just by just you, you looking at the dish you're like oh sesame seeds like where do those come from they're not native to mexico but they the, you know with the dutch slave trade you talked earlier about like the, the southeast you know, the, the Puerto de Veracruz, Tabasco, Yucatan, you know, these came with uh, the slave. The slave trade happened between Mexico. Um, indigenous groups were taken also on the slave trade. African uh, slaves came to Mexico, it was back and forth. And one of the things that came into our foodscape was that sesame seed. It added to the mole and you can see it right here, right away. So it's a reminder to all of us that uh, we have shared histories in many ways. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and it's something that has been done through, you know, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's there are ingredients that I guess we've uh, taken for granted, you know, ingredients that um, we just immediately uh, believe that, oh, yeah, that's how it is. That's how it's always been. Right. Um, you know, but when you add the sesame seed, you know, and actually I have some ingredients here. Uh, that I kind of haven't gone over, but you know, here I have uh, the sesame seeds. And to me, uh, the sesame seed created, uh, it was a game changer, yes. you know, because uh, the flavor profile of a sesame seed is um, so intense for the, I mean, for the size of it, it has this delicious flavor I mean, I think it's more intense than than a peanut, you know, or even a little bit more intense than a walnut. If you're to actually sit there and chew yeah. the sesame seeds, um, and in the evolution of mole, to me, it has become um, an X factor ingredient, you know, when you're when you're making it, you know, just because of that flavor that it just it brings. And when you see it, you'll see it on there. Um, sprinkled over the dish, but you can also very well taste it uh, within the mole sauce. Yeah. Yeah, my mom always had a honkoli, a honkoli in the, in the house. I love, love, love sesame. Um, it just provides some, this, um, a different flavor that I, you know, a creamy, nutty, sometimes even citrusy a little bit, like a little, yeah, it's, I just love it. It's great. Yeah, and actually the ingredients that I have here in front of me that I guess we've had since the beginning of the of our discussion, um, but they're really the main ingredients that are for the mole poblano, you know, and I have here plantains, you know, which is what we use and it's uh, really the natural sugar um, and that natural sweetness that you get, uh, raisins, you know, and um, here at Lola's, it, uh, when I developed this recipe, I developed it as a home style recipe. Um, at Lola's, we don't use uh, uh, the lard, okay. but the original recipe calls for lard. Um, and when you're frying the raisins and the nuts, you know, uh, they plump up, 
they, you know, and yeah. it creates this, uh, just this deep, deep flavor, you know, once the raisin has been cooked down and has a little bit of the saltiness of, of the, of the grasa. Um, you know, I have, uh, the raw peanuts here. Um, I have our, obviously our pumpkin seeds, you know, which are, uh, very famous in, in Mexico. And then I have our chiles, you know, and these chiles are not spicy. You know, I know a lot of people, uh, when you mention the word chile, they think immediately like a jalapeno or a chile. Oh, is it gonna, is it gonna be spicy? Is it gonna burn my mouth? And what these are is these, they're little uh, flavor bombs, you know? Um, and when you're cooking them, the aromas that they let out and, you know, everything that you can smell, you got to remember that you can taste. Oh yeah. And if it, if it smells delicious, it's probably going to taste delicious. I um, can smell the wakiyo in this. Like I can smell the wakiyo. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and it's also, um, I always look at it as when you're making food, it's, it's like a canvas and, you know, you have your colors, you know, and in the kitchen, you know, these are our colors. This is our color palette. You know, this is what we're able to paint our dishes with. And that's what the beauty of these chiles is what gives it this beautiful, you know, red hue to this, to this mole. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you also mentioned the plantains, right? Another West African element that has come into our cuisine and a staple in my home, right? And and I just think this is why I love eating mole, but I love talking about mole because it brings us into a dialogue that Mexico is indigenous, it's European, it's African, it's all of these things, right? And, and by using plantains, and, and then we started cultivating plantains and looking at different kinds of plantains, right? There's all different sizes and stuff. It, it really shows the impact of um, our food, but also who was cooking, right? Indigenous servants right. and black servants were cooking and right. they were sharing recipes, yes. And we still are. Yes, and we still are. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you know, and uh, one thing that I always mention, I put it in the recipes is the plantain. And I think a lot of people, you know, you just don't know because the number one eat, eaten, uh, you know, is, is the banana. And, you know, when you get a, a banana that is, you know, a little beat up or it's already starting to brown, you know, some people will love it because it's at its sweetest point. But most people are like, ah, that banana's already gone, like just chuck it. Um, and what people don't understand is when it comes to a plantain, it's like the ugliest <laughs> darkest blackest one that's the best one that's the one if you, yeah if you get a yellow or a greenish one yeah it's going to be bitter it's dry you know and you, you make it into something else right so there, yeah. there's, there's different recipes for the kind of plantain you have <laughs> yes yeah and for a specifically you know yeah if you're gonna make tostones <laughs> you want the green one but you're also gonna season it you know and you're gonna do your thing but when you're making mole, you want the ripest. Right. I mean, when someone's going to chuck it, you know, no, 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 that's the one I want for the mole because you want that rich, sweet flavor that it has developed as it, as it ripens. Something that I, I often talk about in my home um, is the way that the world looks at ripeness of fruits. Um, you can tell where you're from, right? And I think in the United States, there's... It's a very, very narrow way of looking at ripeness. Um, and in other places, you want something overripe because that's actually the best time to use it. Um, right? yeah, and I can exactly. actually, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pitch it here to, to the folks at MOLA. The plantain might be a good series to talk about you know, food across the Americas and across the Caribe. It might be an interesting series there. Um, all right, I think we have one more, right, Luis? You got one more. Um, as I mentioned, this one is, uh, for me, it's the Holy Grail. You know, there's so many. Um, thank you. 
This is the Mole Negro. Actually, I'm going to put it like this so you can see it. <clears throat> There's so many moles, you know, and, and actually, uh, you and I agree said that we've, we've had um, long professional discussions about mole. Yeah. You know, and, and when you get into it, uh, I'm not talking about a favorite, you know, because there's there's yellow mole, there's red mole, there's about 10 different mole verdes. You know, there's the mole verde from Oaxaca, there's mole verde from uh, Toluca, mole verde from, you know, the one we featured in Guanajuato and um, Mancha Manteles. And uh, but when I when I talk about it in, and I call it the Holy Grail, it's because of uh, the intensity. You know, as I mentioned, um, the mole verde and the pistachio mole, you know, if you were to look at them in a tier from one to four difficulty level to make, mole verde and pistachio is, you know, one or two. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the mole poblano, and, and the reason I say one or two, it also depends on um, the ability of who's cooking it, right? It, if it's your first time, then maybe it'll be a number two difficulty level. No, but if you cook all the time, it's it's a number one. Yeah. Um, mole poblano is a two or three. And then you go into the mole negro and it's a four. And it's a four for a professional. It's a four for, you know, it's the amount of time and the dynamic uh, to create it is, is intense. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that reason, I, I say that it's the king. I say that it's the holy grail, you know, um, in order to get this dark color, you know, you really have to uh, burn the ingredients, mm -hmm. but at the same time, not only do you burn them and destroy them, but then you got to bring them back to life and make them taste delicious. Yeah. And that's intense. You know, uh, and when you have it and you taste it, if you've never experienced it, it's it's just a next level experience, you know, because you do taste the the smokiness of, of everything. And, you know, you do taste uh, the ash of what it was, you know, and it's so hard to explain because it's so rich, um, but at the same time, just so well balanced. Yeah. That to me, it's cooking perfection. You know, when you when you look at this dish and you know to whoever created it, you know, and and, and it, it it is from Oaxaca. There is no doubt about that. Um, but to me, this dish goes toe to toe with uh, French cuisine. Mm -hmm. This dish goes toe to toe with uh, the best of the best Italian. You know, uh, when you talk about dynamics, you know, and everybody looks at, well, what's the best cuisine in the world? You know, immediately people are like, oh, it's French. Yeah. But I would do a Pepsi challenge on this one. And I would say, okay, make this, you know, and I'm going to give the French the benefit of the doubt. They created the souffle, they created the. The, the batter, I mean, so much that was engineered and created, but you look at this dish and this dish, you know, it'll go toe to toe with, uh, with the Muhammad Ali's of the world. Yes, no, I agree. Um, I think it's, it's an ultimate feast. It's, it's kind of praising the Chantico gods at its highest, bringing all these ingredients and chiles together. Um, and and the delicacy of the ingredient, right? That that you have to play this line. I love how you said it. That you we you know you need the ash, but then out of the ash, kind of like the phoenix, out of the ash comes this greatness. Yes. And you need to bring the flavor in and and use these those oils correctly, right? All the oils that you're extracting from the ingredients correctly in order to make this fabulous sauce that is is deep in flavor and texture smooth but oh, still yeah. reminds it's, it's you rich, of it's rich it's, it's smoky yes um you know it has this you know uh, hint of the sweetness 
-hmm. of everything, but at the same time, it also is savory. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, just right now, listening to you talk, I, I get goosebumps from it because earlier in the conversation, you mentioned, you know, uh, the guajolote, which is, uh, you know, over yeah. your shoulder. Yes. Uh, but you also mentioned the pato, mm -hmm. you know, duck. And when we created this dish, I was dead set that we were going to make it with duck. And that's what we serve it with at Lola's. You know, we it's a roasted uh, garlic marinated duck breast. We uh, pan grill it. And then we put the mole over it. And again, you know, duck is delicious. Um, but the star of this dish is the mole negro. Right. You know, and actually I had this dish yesterday as we were getting ready for today. Um, and I was like, you know what, that's what I'm gonna have for lunch. And I had the mole negro and I mean, with the duck and the mole negro and my tortilla and rice, it's just yeah, out of this world. You know, when, um, again, I, I'm very uh, blessed and thankful for, for the way that uh, mole was brought into my life. It was um, my father's mother teaching my mom how to make this mole that has been handed out for hundreds of years and then my family continues to make and sell in Mexico. And, um, and to say that we had it with guajolote during Thanksgiving to me means that in some, some wonderful way, my parents were rebels and, and, and diehards way back when it was like cool to talk about food ways, right? They're like, no, we're doing it the way our ancestors did it, right? Which is amazing. But I have to say, it was a long time. I had to prepare for a week with my family to get that mole ready. How long, like how in advance do you do it in your restaurant? How, like, how do you cope with these very difficult recipes? Um, well, obviously, you know, the, the first three that we did, um, those we do every couple of days, you know, especially mole, it has a, a, a really good shelf life because you just, you cook everything down is the one that we do uh, pretty much fresh daily because okay. we want to keep that uh, beautiful, vibrant green color in it. And um, But uh, the mole negro, we have to do, you know, we create those batches way in advance. Um, and kind of like you have your little batch uh, that you have, yeah. you know, and, that, and what people don't understand is that is shelf stable. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to put it in the fridge and you pull out what you're going to use and then you add whatever you want to add to make it yours. Um, and with ours, that's exactly what we do. So what we do at the tail end after we make the paste, um, the last thing that we do is add, you know, uh, the plantains and we add a couple of chiles here and we, we make our little batch for the day. Oh, wow. That's great. That's good to know. Yeah. It's, it, if, if you, you know, doing it, um, doing it at such large quantities that you're doing and planning it out, you could really do, you can set up yourself a, a shelf stable product that you can then, you know, reconstitute with stock or however you go about it. Um, exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, well, you definitely made me hungry and I appreciate the time <laughs> that MOLA has given us today. Museum of Latin American Art has given us uh, to talk about mole, much appreciated. Um, and thank you for sharing your altar with the community. Um, that is, it, it's beautiful and a wonderful way to, at this time, unite us, right? Um, when so much has happened um, in, in your family's life and my family, in all our family's lives, right? Change has, has come and I appreciate the time you've taken uh, to share your knowledge and work in mole. Oh, thank you, Rizella. And again, it's a pleasure. You know, it's a, it's a pleasure to work with the museum again. I know, um, you know, we've been so busy, you know, the last couple of years that, you know, we really haven't kind of come back around full circle, but, um, you know, have, being able to have this discussion and at the same time, uh, you know, being able to participate with the museum again um, it's, it's, it's nothing but love. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, take care. Um, I'm, I will be driving by Lola's to get some mole later on today. 
and um, have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, and take some time to, to think about your ancestors, those who have passed, um, and enjoy Dia de los Muertos with your family. Thank Gracias. you.